In this video we want to talk about globalization. Uh, we want to see what it is and see what brought it about. During the last decades of the 20th century many barriers to international trade fell and a wave of firms began pursuing global strategies to gain competitive advantage. There was greater awareness of opportunities in other countries for companies in the West to cut costs and to outsource production. So there was much more awareness of opportunities for for cost cutting but there was also an awareness for uh, ways in which to extend the market. Products which were successful in Western countries could be extended into other countries. Countries that were previously out of bounds, countries that could not be entered. And in this context we're thinking of countries like China for example. But also what was the Soviet bloc? In Eastern Europe uh, the, the Soviet bloc had disintegrated so now there was access to markets that were previously uh, out, of, uh, out of bounds for Western uh, companies. So rather than thinking in terms of national markets and national economies, leaders of business thought in terms of global markets. There was a big change in strategic thinking in companies in the West. Prior to uh, the, the whole movement towards globalization, companies considered their markets to be on a national scale perhaps, or even a regional scale, depends on the size of the company. But with the advent of possibilities of trade with other countries, countries that were, as I said, previously uh, could not be accessed. With the advent of that trade, companies started to think globally. So the markets became very big, giving companies potential to grow. So there, there was, first of all, a cost-cutting uh, potential in getting products outsourced into those countries because labor was cheaper and because production costs were cheaper it was possible to outsource and import back into the West the products from uh, from the outsourced activities which would cut costs and try to give the companies competitive advantage in the domestic markets but there also there was the extension of the market it was now much bigger Let's first consider why there has been such a rapid expansion of overseas trade in recent decades. What brought it about? Why, why did all of this happen? Well, first of all, there was an increase in real living standards. Now, by real living standards, I mean the purchasing power of the consumer had increased. So, incomes received by customers, by consumers I should say, uh, incomes had gone up faster than rates of inflation. So consumers were able to buy more. Uh, part of the, the buying process was also contacts with uh, other countries through holidays and greater awareness of uh, the potential for globalization in terms of costs and uh, contacts and ease of doing trade. So those real living standards were increasing in the West. Uh, there was pressure on companies to cut costs to try and uh, continue to grow their businesses in the West, but the markets were finite. They were big but quite finite. So really companies were looking to extend their markets and with greater awareness through travel and through uh, media contacts and so on, uh, there was greater understanding of potential if the companies could get into these big markets, for example China. There was also, and I'll touch on this in, in different ways, also of course better communications and that also facilitated the flow of information. There was also trade liberalization. The World Trade Organization was aiming to uh, 
improve trade throughout the world by reducing obstacles to trade, by reducing tariffs and quotas and obstacles to trade of, of all types. And these negotiations to reduce trade barriers were ongoing and clearly there were benefits. We know that international trade because of the, the law of comparative advantage we know that it brings about advantages to uh, the consumer. We, we get more products and we get cheaper products and we get greater choice. So the World Trade Organization was pushing all the time to reduce the obstacles to trade. And of course there was also the deepening and the expansion of the European Union which created a single market within Europe uh, created an enormous market within Europe. So we were starting to, to see the world in terms almost of trading blocks. We have the North American free trade area comprising of Canada, America and Mexico. But in Europe we have currently 26 countries who are aiming to join their economies together. There is debate about it, of course, as to whether it should happen or not, but the point is it's one very big market. The old Soviet Union was coming apart, so there was greater opportunity to extend uh, markets into what was previously um, or what were previously countries controlled by Russia into Poland and uh, Czechoslovakia and uh, countries that were under the influence of the the Russians. But Russia itself opened and it became a big player in the, the global market. And of course in the East there's the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, whose aim it is to make trade easier between their members and of course this makes it easy for the European Union and for for the Americans and so on to negotiate with ASEAN directly and thereby get access to all the ASEAN countries. And then there was the big prize which is China because of its population size, because of the, the sheer numbers involved, the size of the markets uh, and the Chinese government wanted uh, new technology, they wanted development, they wanted uh, the development of their country in general. So they embraced it. So all of this came together to try to lead into uh, an understanding, lead us to an understanding of globalization. So there was the transition to market systems in Eastern Europe. Uh, people started to learn about capitalism. They learned about how markets worked. Uh, there was less fear on their parts to engage in this type of way of living. Previously the state was seen as the provider of many items, uh, accommodation and jobs and so on. Now there was greater emphasis and greater understanding of market conditions in many countries. The rapid growth of what was then called the, the Asian Tigers, China and India, and China and India still remain the big prizes simply because of their size, uh, because of their, their, their incredible populations and because of the the way in which they are developing. They are developing with modern technology, they are developing um, sophisticated middle classes, uh, they understand the, the nature of capitalism. So these are rapidly growing countries. The Asian Tiger uh, expression doesn't uh, apply or doesn't seem to apply anymore but certainly there were countries in Asia who experienced very rapid rates of economic growth and that caused excitement and interest in trying to develop into those countries. 
There was also privatisation and liberalisation of domestic markets. Uh, privatisation was, to a large extent, popularised by Margaret Thatcher in the UK when she was Prime Minister. Uh, she took industries that were in the public domain and sold them, and sold them to, to private investors. Um, and there were many of these, railways and electric companies and so on, telephones. Uh, these became private companies because she believed that private companies would give a better service to the customers. Um, there was privatisation and liberalisation of domestic markets in many countries following on from that. And we now understand that there is more emphasis in many countries uh, to more emphasis on privatised markets and on the uh, almost the requirement to show interest in privatisation if the country is going to participate fully in this type of trade. Investors want to see governments uh, promoting trade and economic development and showing an interest in market economics. Uh, if they don't see that, they're more reluctant to invest. There may be a fear still amongst many investors that the country will revert back to what it was in the past. There was also the deregulation of international capital markets. Money could flow between centres, uh, financial centres throughout the world could flow more easily. Could flow from London to Tokyo, from Tokyo to Paris to New York or whatever it was. Um, so there was, there was uh, better communications between the financial centres, more information was available and there was less regulation of the financial markets so that uh, vast sums of money could move very easily between the various centres leading to almost a single market because uh, when a profit potential arose in one market uh, the money would flow there to capitalise, to to gain that, that profit. But of course in so doing it would alter the conditions in that market, bringing the, making the conditions less favourable for profit potential, so the same money may move on to a different market. And in that sense all the centres were really operating within the same market, so we could see globalisation uh, appearing within the capital markets. And there was a fall in transport costs. Uh, container ships became bigger and cheaper to run. There, there was much more emphasis on efficient running and there was a better infrastructure as well in terms of logistics. Ports were specifically designed to cater for large container ships and uh, there was much more thinking, forward thinking about the process of logistics, distribution, getting products from one side of the world to the other and getting them there cheaply. And of course as I said earlier there was global communications, uh, the advent of the internet and uh, computer networks greatly facilitated the uh, flow of information between centres. Again, causing an expansion of trade, much more understanding, uh, easier way of working because uh, companies could be in almost instantaneous contact with branches and managers overseas. So they were able to synchronise their requirement and there was a meshing of requirements with production and shipping and it was easier to to, to deal with because the communications was much better. So what is globalization? Well, globalization is a business philosophy based on the belief that the world is becoming more homogeneous. National distinctions are fading and will eventually disappear. Now that may be 
too too grand in its aspirations and we're not sure if we want national distinctions to fade away we we like to keep our identities and we like to keep our cultural heritage and so on so we don't want to be merged into one single homogeneous world culture but the way globalization is emerging it appears that that's not necessarily the case that there is a, a, a very slow encroachment of this homogeneity and that cultures are being maintained and probably this is why we see the growth in international tourism but it's certainly also the case that we see when we travel that uh, high streets in different cities around the world are starting to look very similar the same shops are starting to appear, the same outlets and the the same mechanisms and the same products uh, are starting to appear as well uh, mechanisms for communications, uh, we see the same telephone systems and we're starting to identify the big producers of telephones and we know the attributes of the telephones from one country to the next televisions are starting to look the same <coughs> white kitchenware and cars uh, but also cosmetics and fashion items it's cutting right the way across and it's as if the consumers in one country are watching the consumers in another country watching it on television perhaps and and copying so we're, we're starting to get a homogeneity in terms of buildings and design so if we look at the the cityscape, if we look at cities and how the buildings in cities are going up, uh, cities are starting to look the same. They've got skyscrapers. They've got a certain feel to them which makes them very similar to each other. And this could be the product of communications uh, could be the product of openness because there's more information uh, available to architects and industrialists and retailers and so on uh, it could be simply that uh, there is a desire on the part of consumers and producers in different countries to copy best practice because it's to their advantage so as to whether the world is becoming homogeneous or not is is difficult. There may be pockets of resistance in the sense of some cultural identity remains and has been preserved. Whether that's viable in the long run or not is difficult to say. Linguistically, of course, uh, the 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 culture will be safe in, in terms of large languages like Mandarin for example but what the people speak about in Mandarin may be exactly what people speak about in London or in Paris or in Munich or wherever so debatable point globalization is an increase in interconnectedness and interdependence of economic activity and social relations it's certainly the case that there is greater uh, interdependence in economic activity. It's possible for a company in one country to con control subsidiaries in another country. Again, because of communications and because of ease of contact. Um, it's also the case that uh, we know more about each other because of globalized networks in communications and in the media so we have a greater understanding of the issues confronting people in rural China today perhaps than we ever did before and likewise people in other countries will see us and will start to get an understanding for of the way in which we live so there is greater contact on, on a social level uh, there's greater understanding on a social level uh, and potentially contact uh, through tourism, uh, through online contacts. But the economic systems are certainly interdependent. Uh, the growth of 
globalised organisations has meant greater coordination between economic activities in one country and those in another. If the world is homogeneous, then companies need to think globally and standardise their strategies across national boundaries. So there has to be a, a mind shift in terms of control and direction of business. The strategic objectives of the business will have changed. Uh, previously, the business may have seen it, its market nationally or even regionally. It depends but now it may consider its market to be global and it has to adopt all of its processes to ensure that it's delivering good quality product, uh, good aftercare service, good marketing uh, of the product in general but it has to deliver this on a global scale. Now the rewards for doing this is an immense increase potential in sales but it does require different thinking on the part of the organization. The organization must think globally, must try to understand the determinants of demand in different markets, must understand the importance of pricing in different markets or design. And national cultures and uh, nat national perspectives of particular products may vary and this may may require the organization to tweak its production to tweak its design to meet what is required in other markets so it may lead to some product diversity and a strategy would have to be put in place to enable this to happen within the organization so there's much more to think about uh, in modern business than perhaps in the past. In modern business there are greater opportunities because of globalization but there are also bigger challenges. Globalization concerns well uh, trading goods and services clearly that's the case so globalization is to do with trading goods and services but it's also to do with investment companies in one country investing in another country. Um, it may invest in several countries. Uh, it may produce its product under license in other countries. It may franchise its product. Um, it may produce the product itself. So globalization concerns investment. There's also issues associated with the labour force. The, the transfer of skills from one country to another may mean uh, key workers having contact with uh, trainees and, and people learning to make the product in other countries. So there may be labour force movement issues. And in a globalised setting the labour force may have to be more uh, mobile, more flexible, more capable of travel and working in, in other countries and uh, training personnel in other countries to make the product and to understand the business, understand the company and and so on. And of course also uh, labour force will be required to move and to have greater contact so as to control perhaps initiatives in other countries. Products um, are obviously the concern of globalization and making products as I said earlier that suit particular cultures. The design of the product, the price of the product, the attributes, the functions. Uh, these should be married up against the requirements of that particular society so the product may not be identical to the original product in many cases it will be identical in the case of let's say cosmetics uh, the, the cosmetics produced in one country will be essentially the same as those produced in another country 
And that's rational because it's very expensive to undertake research and development for many items, including cosmetics and ethical pharmaceuticals and so on. So these products, the, the cost of the research and the development can be spread over much bigger markets. So it's clearly in the company's interest to be involved in other countries. So products, uh, many products will have to be uh, tweaked to meet local tastes. Some products will not be tweaked. Depends on the nature of the product. But it's certainly the case, of course, that globalization considers uh, products themselves. And production. Production is uh, one of the reasons why uh, globalization has become so important. The whole process of outsourcing. Uh, companies that previously made <coughs> excuse me made products from start to finish may now outsource part of the production process. They may outsource all of it and simply buy the product in from from elsewhere. Uh, that may be driven by cost considerations. It's cheaper to produce it in China than it is to produce it in Germany or in in England. These are high cost economies. But that of course means that uh, jobs which would have been created in those countries will now be lost to producers overseas. On the other hand, the product is cheaper. We can't have everything. It's, it's a balancing act. Technology. Well, one of the effects of globalization is the transfer of technology. And there's been a very rapid transfer of technology, say, to, to parts of China, uh, which were perhaps in the past mainly agrarian. The, the workforce worked on the land. But they've missed out lots of stages in development. They've gone from working on the land to working with sophisticated machinery, working with sophisticated networks, making sophisticated products. So technology has been transferred. In the case of the UK and in the case of America, in the case of Germany and Europe, many parts of Europe, technology evolved. It went through stages. It stepped up to where we are now. But with the advent of globalization, the technology may start at the top. It starts with what we've got in the West now. And as I said, that means that uh, there's been big jumps in those societies. So people who worked previously on the land, let's say, eking out a living on the land, will now work in factories with very sophisticated machinery and processes. So technology has been transferred. Of course, research and development becomes cheaper because uh, not in absolute terms, but in on average terms, because the markets are bigger. So there are more customers, more sales. So the the burden of research and development has lessened because of the extension of the markets. So globalization brings about uh, the potential for more research and development, which of course just adds to the technological change we see around us every day and the development of new products. So larger markets leads companies into more research, more development, the development of new products and uh, this in turn feeds into the globalization process. So it's, it's, a, it's a cycle. Uh, more globalization, bigger markets, more research and development, new products, even more globalization as a consequence, and so on. There is the exchange of ideas and knowledge. Um, globalization has meant that uh, universities and colleges have more contact. Uh, students from one country may study in another country and get an experience of the culture and a feeling for that country. Uh, have a greater understanding of the way people think 
and people think differently throughout the world. So there is a, an exchange of ideas and, and knowledge. It also happens through travel. When uh, China opened and people from the West could visit China, uh, they, they got a greater understanding of the, the depth of the Chinese culture and the, the way in which the, the people lived. And, uh, but new ideas were given to the, to the tourists and to the business people who went there. And then eventually, when, when the countries opened completely, there was more understanding of the requirements of the uh, consumers in those countries. So there is a, an exchange of ideas. The people are talking, they talk to each other. And through the, this process, they get a greater understanding of their requirements. And that, in turn, may spark off commercial opportunities. There are also issues about intellectual property. That, unfortunately, with globalization, there's more opportunity for ideas to be stolen. Companies may spend a lot of time in research and development trying to bring out a new product and to innovate a product, bring up new designs, only to find that when it's proven and successful that it's copied elsewhere. So there, have to be, there has to be agreements between governments to try and stop uh, the, the wholesale theft of ideas. It's felt that it's only right and proper that someone who invents some product and that innovates and brings it to market has gone through all of that trouble, all of that hassle. That, that person should be entitled to some rewards. They should have a patent or a, a patent, as people say, or some intellectual, some protection for their intellectual property which gives them a period of time in which they have a monopoly status. They can capitalize on the monopoly status and earn considerable profits. And after the protection runs out, it's then open to competition. But there should be a period of time in which the people who have good ideas should be protected and should be able to make monopoly profits to reward them for the good idea, to give them incentives to have good ideas and bring out new products. So it's difficult for them to accept that when they have a good idea it's just copied by other people in other countries and they can then enter the market and start selling copies of their product. It's even worse uh, when we see uh, counterfeit t-shirts and counterfeit clothing. Uh, people who have worked hard to bring up designs and sell their designs at high prices to give them a profit, to repay them for their efforts. But then the products, the same products, the look-alike products, arrive from other countries which are fake. And that is it's soul destroying for the uh, innovators and for the, the people who come up with the, the various ideas. So it's felt there is an issue over intellectual property and the protection of, uh, of intellectual property. And this is one of the reasons why um, government leaders talk to each other and try to harmonize their approach to the intellectual property issue to try and protect inte intellectual property. The key features of globalization, well, there's a rapid expansion of international trade. We've seen that happen. Um, much more contact between countries, much more expansion of international trade. There's an internationalization of products and services by large firms. Again, as I said, if we walk down the high street or the main street in many cities and towns of many, in many countries, we'll see the same outlets, we'll see the same products, we'll see people wearing essentially the same fashion clothing. Uh, hopefully not fake clothing, but we'll see them wearing the same fashion clothing. They'll be driving similar cars. They will 
have the same concerns as people in other countries. We see the same household products for sale. So there is an internationalization of products and services by large firms. There is a growing importance of multinational corporations. Uh, the bigger companies clearly have set up in just about every country. They seem to have a presence just about everywhere. Um, that's understandable because of their size and the fact that they need to be there to exert power within that market. Um, so the, the large multinational corporations seem to cut right across the world. And that of course also leads to issues and accusations levied at them that they're only doing this to avoid paying tax. So they may not want to stay in high taxed countries and the profits they make in the high tax countries by creative accounting techniques are able to move that into countries with low tax so they, pay, they, they miss out paying a lot of tax. But that in a sense is a big issue that could be debated elsewhere as to whether uh, that's the fault of the companies or the fault of the governments and their respective taxation systems. There are increases in capital transfers across national boundaries. We see capital moving from one country to the other faster, smoother, more efficiently than ever before. So it's easy for companies to set up in different countries, to open plants in different countries, open production facilities in different countries. Um, we also see uh, financial assets moving from one country to the other and moving quite smoothly through the banking system. So there's greater contact between countries caused by that also. And of course, as I said earlier in the earlier talk, there is globalization of technology. Uh, it is the case that the technology that's used in one country will be used in another country. So we're starting to see uh, homogeneity in terms of technology and we see it in terms of uh, consumer products, telephones as I mentioned earlier, televisions and so on. But we also see it in production. There will be the introduction of, uh, let's say, computer-aided manufacturing techniques and sophisticated uh, production machinery and so on. And those will be used right throughout the world. So there is a, a globalization in technology. There's, there are shifts in production from country to country. Sometimes companies may make part of a product in one country and a different part of the same product in another country. And they may be joined up in a third country. Um, it's what makes sense to the company. It's the company finding the best way to produce its product. The best type of... Um, production facility in one country and in another country, another country and then an assembly perhaps someplace else again. So production is much more fluid on, in a globalized system. It can involve many countries and the movement of part production from one uh, country to another. Semi-finished goods moving from one country to another country for assembly perhaps. Increased freedom and capacity uh, and firms to undertake economic transactions across national boundaries. Well, of course, all of this can only happen if governments facilitate it. Governments must have agreements about international trade. Uh, the governments must uh, subscribe to the World Trade Organization's uh, treaties and they must sign up to the fact that their economies are opening up and they must promote this. Um, it must be promoted by all the countries and it must be promoted openly by all the countries and full, uh, wholeheartedly, I should say. Um, 
If it's not, if one country is reticent for whatever reason or reluctant to open uh, its uh, its country, then globalization will will be stopped in that context. So in order for globalization to happen, it encompasses a lot of uh, other issues. Political stability, for example. Uh, investors will be reluctant, reluctant to go into countries if the country is not stable, if the leadership of the country uh, have a history of changing their minds or just implementing rules without due process or uh, there may be a fear that they, perhaps their assets will be confiscated or nationalised. Or it could be the case that uh, some countries have bad human rights records and that customers, when they know that they, the products come from those countries, will be reluctant to purchase them. There are many issues that need to be taken into consideration in terms of globalization. Some of these issues may restrict the possibilities for globalization. Some of them may reduce uh, the advantages of moving into some countries. Even though there may, there may be considerable profits to be made, uh, the organizations may be reluctant to full, fully open up within those countries. So the onus is on governments to be as open and as honest and as consistent as possible. There is a fusing of national markets. Again, as I said, high streets are becoming more homogeneous and we're starting to see the same products uh, within different countries. And uh, there's a greater understanding that people are people. People in different countries want to get a good deal. They want to get a variety of products, good quality products, at reasonable prices. And if a product is successful in one country, it may be introduced into another country. Because essentially people are the same the world over. Economic integration has uh, come to, to, to bear also on the whole process of globalization. Countries, because their national markets are so interconnected, and because there's such a, a high scale of contact between the countries, some country, some economies are starting to um, fuse. Some some economies are starting to start to feel the same. Now we've seen this in Europe with the development of the single European market. Uh, now the single European market has a single currency, so it's it's becoming more like America. There are different states in America. They all have the same American currency, the dollar. In Europe, there are different countries. In a sense, they're very similar to the states in America, the different states in America, but they have a similar, the same currency, the euro. But it can happen outside of uh, trading blocks, such as uh, the EU, uh, and outside of all the various trading blocks. It could be that just simply some countries have such a degree of contact that the two economies are really running on the same in the same way. And for a long time this has happened between, say, the Scandinavian countries, Norway and Sweden and so on. Um, in the past, the Republic of Ireland and the UK, there was such a, a degree of integration between the economies uh, one was very big and very powerful, the other was very weak at the time, but such a degree of contact that they were really, in effect, the same economy, or part of the same economy. So, whenever there's a, a high scale of contact between countries due to globalization, then their economic systems start to integrate. There is global economic interdependence. Uh, there is much more recognition that economies should support each other and that if one economy is starting to 
dip or suffer in some way, it'll have ramifications in other economies. So there's no immunity to financial crisis. If it happens in one country, it'll happen in other countries. And this was brought home during the, the banking crisis that swept right, right its way around the world. But it's, it's also the case that if countries are doing well, they can become the engines for the other countries, for, for related economies, economies that have high degrees of contact with their economy, that they will be pulled along. So, for example, at the moment, many countries look to India and China and the big, highly populated countries. These will be the engines for growth into the future. Now the growth of the multinational enterprise, well, the, these large corporations are constantly uh, on the search for growth markets. They're constantly looking out for ways in which to grow. And they don't look nationally, they look internationally. They look into every corner of the globe to see if there are opportunities for growth. Because they have the capacity to do it. They have the infrastructure, they have the expertise. So they're looking to find areas of growth throughout the world. And the markets they serve, they serve those markets with essentially similar products. They, they make uh, successful products in one country, they try them out in another country, they might rename the product or repackage it, but it's essentially the same product. So the research and development effort, as I said much earlier, uh, that will be spread over greater sales. So it has less of an impact. So the benefit from that, that's an economy of size, an economy of scale. But they're able to look at their, the, the global market, to look for areas of growth, to look for ways in which their markets the markets in which they operate has similar characteristics to other markets and in this way they're able to transfer their skills from one economy to another. The, these skills could be in marketing, after sales, production, design, innovation, whatever it is. But there's a linkage between the different parts of the company a multinational corporation. There's linkages between them, different aspects of the company, but these aspects of the company, these different parts, may be in different countries. They certainly have a desire to reduce costs, so they're constantly looking for ways in which production costs can be reduced. So they're looking to countries which have uh, low labour costs. They may also look to countries that have very lenient planning frameworks so they're able to just open companies where they want and and when they want. So there's a desire to shift production to countries with lower unit labour costs. Um, that in the literature on globalisation is the standard uh, view but in fact some um, companies may consider this to be uh, too too much, too, going too far. They, they may want to look at the country, look at its political leaders, look at its social structure, look at its history, uh, look at the way it deals with other countries uh, before it embarks on setting up in that country. So it's not entirely driven by low labour costs. There are other factors that, particularly the, the larger companies, will be sensitive about. If they're going to make significant investments in a country, they want to make sure that that is where they want to be and that that country uh, conforms to some sort of standard and it's free from corruption and it's got a good police force, a good history on human rights, uh, it's got a good infrastructure, stable relationship between the people and the government and, and so on. There is a desire to avoid transportation costs. Uh, it's 
logical that the, the companies should try to configure their business in a way that minimizes transportation costs. Transportation cost is is really um, a dead uh, dead money. It's it's uh, it's adding to value in the sense that it's bringing the products together or bringing the products to market. But if, if it could be avoided, it would be much better. So companies try to minimize the impact of transportation costs in the total cost structure for the product. So they will set up in countries uh, so as to minimize shipping the product to those countries. They will make the product in situ rather than ship it there. There's also of course uh, a desire to avoid tariffs and non-tariff barriers. Sometimes countries will impose tariffs. Tariffs are just a tax on imports. Um, although the World Trade Organization is trying to uh, reduce uh, tariffs and reduce the obstacles to trade, some countries do tax imports and some countries tax them very highly. So to avoid paying the tax, multinational corporations may start to produce the product inside the country. So they're, they're no longer paying hefty taxes on the imports. So if they make it within the country it will be cheaper and they will sell more within that country. But then of course the company that they have established there will become a profit centre. And that may mean it may be difficult to get the profits out of the country. It depends on to the extent to which the the banking system is linked to other parts of the banking system throughout the world or, or what the view of the government is on the repatriation of profits. There might be issues like that. But by and large companies try to avoid paying tariffs. There are also non-tariff barriers. Sometimes to get around the uh, World Trade Organization obstacles uh, or, or requirements countries instead of having tariffs they have bureaucracies so they say that imports are not taxed there's no tariffs on the imports but it takes forever it takes a long time to get the products through the customs so they arrive at the port and they're not released for weeks perhaps that means the the capital in those products is lying idle for weeks so sometimes countries use non-tariff uh, barriers, bureaucracies and um, inefficient procedures. They are deliberately inefficient to try and stop imports. Forward vertical integration. Well, it's trying to move towards the, the customer so the the company is trying to get close to the customer and provide the goods and services close to the point of sale and in that way it will minimize the cost effects of uh, producing in other countries it, it minimizes uh, the the possibilities or the the costs the possibilities of raising costs due to transportation and due to logistics and distribution. So if they can produce near to where their sales are going to be that will minimize their costs. So they try to move forward towards the customer and they try to perhaps uh, even have their own outlets. Perhaps they, they make the product in the country and then they try to sell it directly. It depends on what the, the nature of the product is and what the uh, commercial practices within the country are. Certainly it's the case that the product life cycle is extended through globalization because the product life cycle in one country uh, the product may be in decline. It may have matured and now entered into the decline stage in the product life cycle. But in other countries it may be just starting out. Uh, it may be 
an innovation and welcomed by consumers in the other country as uh, an extremely interesting product, one that they want to have. So the product life cycle is just kicking off in one country and ending off in another country. So the, the product life cycle in, in total has been extended. Deregulation of capital markets. Well, multinational corporations have benefited from the deregulation of capital markets because they're able to move their capital easily uh, between countries. So this has facilitated the role of the multinational corporations in the globalization process. So the deregulation of capital markets has been to the advantage of the globalization process. Uh, it's been to the, it's it's been to the advantage of the multinational corporations, I should say, within that process. The multinational corporations are able to repatriate profits, move profits from one centre to the other, uh, move resources to cover costs from one centre to another. They're able to juggle their financial assets in ways that are easily facilitated through the international capital markets. So there are many parts to the globalization story. There are many factors in play. Um, it could only happen if the technology and the communication systems are in place. And they have come into place in the last probably 20 years. There's more understanding of the requirements for globalization to take place governments are facilitating it through their own practices and through the policies they're pursuing and there is greater understanding of the benefits that flow from globalization within companies and an eagerness to get involved in this process because of the extension of the market and because of the reduction in costs but that's all we're going to deal with in this talk so let's leave it at that and say thank you for watching